I got to show you this video that plays so perfectly into our show today. You might have seen it. My team shared it with me. This is out of Milwaukee. Just moments before this school bus went up in flames, the bus driver, her name is Imanique Williams, was able to pull all 37 children off that bus. But wait, there's more. She is eight months pregnant and leaped into action. And because of her fast thinking, all of those babies were able to go home to their family. This woman is being called a hero. And so that video that we showed you of the bus, that flows right into this show that we have today. People who are really doing big, big, incredible things with the goal of helping others, like our first guest. He is super hot right now, fresh off of the huge success of Top Gun Maverick, where he starred with Tom Cruise and Miles Teller as a fighter pilot, Ruben Payback Fitch, right? And before that, well, he wanted us all to pay back against every ex we've had as his complicated character, Lawrence, the on again, off again, back on again, love interest of Issa D in the groundbreaking series, Insecure. So Jay is making all the right moves these days and it's his latest project that is truly, truly compelling. Jay, yes, as handsome as he is, and I heard you say that, this man has a heart of gold and he is now the producer of a new podcast. It's focused on a decades long unsolved series of crimes and it's hosted by veteran journalist and radio host Celeste Headley. Their goal in bringing attention to this case is to bring justice to families after the unimaginable happened. Take a look. Carol Spinks, Darlenia Johnson, Brenda Crockett, Nina Moshe Yates, Brenda Woodard, and Diane Williams. All were abducted from their Washington, D.C. neighborhoods and murdered between April 1971 and September 1972. The homicide detectives termed the cases the little girl cases. A new podcast revisits the crimes and the investigations. It took four murders before the police finally realized that one person was responsible. A chilling clue, a letter found on one of the victim's bodies. 50 years later, the so-called freeway phantom has never been found. And victims' family members still want the answers and justice they deserve. We still care, and it still hurts. We just want to know what happened. Tam Fam, please welcome actor, producer of Freeway Phantom podcast star now, Jay Ellis, and journalist, radio host, best-selling author, and host of the Freeway Phantom podcast, Celeste Headley. Um, thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much. Jay, I actually hesitated on saying podcast star because these cases are unbelievable. Yeah. The pain is real. The lack of justice for these women, real. I don't know, though, without your star power, you are red hot right now. You're off of Maverick. You're off of Insecure. It's with the star power that you have now answers may be provided in 50 years of silence. How do you balance that at this great time in your life, the platform you have might give justice? One, I always realized why I got into this. Hmm. And I think uh, the accolades and the travel and all those things are amazing, but at the end of the day, it's to reach people. And it's to tell stories that matter and it's to connect people and do something lasting. For me, doing this podcast, you know, it started with, and it started back in 2017 with the hashtag "Bring Our Girls Home," yeah. right? And and when all the girls were missing, and the young black girls were missing in D.C., and I just couldn't wrap my head around how the statistic is about 1,700 kids go missing in the D.C. area in a year. Some of those are runaways. Some of those are people who call too early. But when you boil that number down, you're still talking about seven, eight hundred kids a year which is a huge number, and I just couldn't sleep with that. And so started doing digging and, and found this case and, and Celeste. Celeste, the, the case of the Freeway Phantom. Yeah. I was even embarrassed until I read the work that you've done, listened to the podcast. I've done true crime for many, many years. I've been a journalist for 30 years. I didn't know a lot about this case. Yeah, me too. For 50 years, why the silence behind this case? Why haven't we seen the national attention involving these stories. 
even I, babies. You can, and one of them as young as 10 years old, some of them in their school gym outfit, right, going to the store to pick up groceries a block away for their family. I mean, there's no way to get away from the fact that these were not only young black girls, um, but they came from a, a, a wor very working class, um, the struggling end of the working class all neighborhood. All in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah, all on the east side of Washington, D.C. And I had never heard of this case either, and that's really what drew me to this story. It's because, I mean, look at their faces. How do we not know this? This is a man who killed as many people as the son of Sam. How many movies and books and documentaries do we have about that killer, but th these girls have been forgotten? And, and when people wonder why, you know, that is, listen, it's, it is a horrifying case down to the letter that the individual left. So some might say, well, it doesn't have all of these things that make it interesting for TV. There is a letter from the killer yeah. that is one of the most that terrifying... That he pinned to one of the girl's bodies. He pinned to the child's body, one of the most terrifying things that I've read and ever. And he made her write it. It was in her handwriting. You know, there's a reason why it's hashtag say their names, right? There's a power in m remembering somebody's life and that it mattered, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons we wanted to do this podcast was to bring that power so that they would remember these girls. But he treated them like literal garbage. You've had the opportunity to speak with surviving family members. A lot of them have passed away, but there are still others who are waiting for that moment of the phone call to say, we have this individual, or at the very least, we know who this person was and we've identified him. Uh, one was uh, Carolyn Spinks, the twin sister of the victim, Carol Spinks. They were 13 years old at the time of Carol's murder. Um, we have a clip of Carolyn's recollection of that week. Let's play it. I knew something bad had happened. I knew that. I just didn't know what. But after like the second day, that's when I started feeling the pains. <sighs> and I used to sit on the bottom bunk of the bed and just rock. And I would get pains and I would, I'd be in and out, in and out. Oh my God, it was terrible. It was, oh God, it was the worst. It was the worst. I still feel pain to this day. Jay, when you heard that for the first time, what was your reaction? I'm the father of a little girl. Uh, and all I could think about is protecting her and her not being there and, and how I would feel if she wasn't there and I didn't have an answer. And if I didn't have an answer 40 or 50 years later and I still had to sit with that pain every single day. And I think one of the things that was super important to us is like this was not about rehashing someone's trauma. We wanted them to tell the story in the way that they wanted to tell their story, in the way that they wanted to share with us their feelings, their pain, um, what their hopes were for, for these cases and for their, their, their loved ones. And um, I, I don't know, I just, I, even now, like I just get um, kind of overran with emotion just thinking about the fact that like 50 years later, these families have no answers. She doesn't know what happened to her sister. One of the lead investigators of the case, retired Washington, D.C. police detective, Romaine Jenkins, uh, dedicated her life to solving these crimes. She's still working with the, the case. Um, we have another clip. Let's play it. Whoever grabbed these young ladies grabbed them right in their own neighborhood. Nina Moshe Yates went to the grocery store in the 4800 block of Benin Road. She's picked up and she, she's grabbed in the 4900 block. And nobody sees anything. All them people out there, I don't care when you go out there. You have East Capitol Street there. It's always people because you're close to the district line. People are doing shopping. She's grabbed at a time when there are lots of people out. Kids are out and nobody sees a thing because he fit in with the community. What does that clip tell you, her observation tell you, Celeste? That Nina Moshe Yates, in fact, most of these girls were grabbed off the street in the broad daylight. Um, one of them had just come out of the grocery store and they found her little her bag of groceries that she had dropped. What that means is that this was probably not a white man. Um, this was a very predominantly black neighborhood and somebody would notice that. This was probably not a police officer because that would have been noticed. This was somebody who was relatively familiar and fit in and took advantage of that 
took advantage of the fact that he was familiar to the community. Mm. It, it's, I mean, even, it's like your Jay was talking about getting for Klimt. It, it still gets you the fact that we're supposed to keep these girls safe even today. That's our responsibility.